to another episode of Batavia Spotlight, where we get to know more about community organizations and businesses here in Batavia and in our local communities. I'm Ellen Huxtable, your host. And today I'm very pleased to welcome Eddie Perez, who is the Chief Instructor of the Defense Training Institute right here in Batavia. How are you doing, Helen? So thank you for joining us, Eddie. Tell us about the Defense Training Institute. Well, we're a traditional martial arts organization. Um, we run ages between five years old and 60. And the only reason I say 60 is because that's, that's currently what our oldest student is right now. Okay. Um, Everything is, like when I, when, when I say traditional martial arts, I, we do pure self-defense. There's no sport aspect of it all. Everything is based on, you know, what happens if you get in an attack situation, you need to defend yourself. Uh, there we, we focus, we try our best not to focus on anything that would have to do with um, a sport type environment or a referee type thought process. Um, and what happens if you get caught in a position where you just can't back away? Okay. Is it based on other martial arts, or is it a blend of certain kinds of martial arts? Is it something that's totally different that you've developed? The, fa the, the main focus of our school is a martial art called Hapkido. And Hapkido is, is a Korean martial art. It has its history in, um, it, it has its history in Japan, but um, the founder spent 30 years in Japan, and from Japan, after World War II, he went back to Korea, and in Korea is where he founded Hapkido. And Hapkido means the way of coordinated power. It is uh, closely related to the Japanese martial art of Aikido. Okay. They both came from the original s same system. So is this something that can be obviously used no matter how big or how old or how young you happen to be? It's something that everybody can benefit from then? Absolutely, absolutely. It's very similar to, um, it, it's, it's closely related to and very similar to, like I said, Aikido, but also to Judo, Jiu Jitsu, and those styles, whereas in, um, versus their distance of two people fighting at a distance, mm -hmm. like boxing, or you'd find in kick, um, any kicking martial art. Mm -hmm. Hapkido is a grappling system, a vertical grappling system, where it's a lot of grabbing, takedowns, joint locks, holding your opponent. So you, you do use your, 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 um, your body in a, a kind of closer, but we don't focus on the high kicks that you would, the way you would find in arts like uh, Muay Thai or Taekwondo. Okay. So it's a, it's a very practical application then. Yes, it is. Yes. And so now, what kind of programs do you have? You mentioned to me earlier some programs that you have. What are some of the programs that you have? Well, we run the traditional program with the you know, martial arts classes. We have uh, the regular group classes that are in the evenings. Our first class begins at 4 o'clock. We also have private lessons, and the private lessons are for those students who want to train in just self-defense or what we call combatives. And maybe they're getting ready either to go off to college or to go, like I had recently, a, um, a young lady that I trained that was her, her dad paid for her training because she was going off to Europe. Okay. And just do those kind of things. Um, we also focus on a program we called uh, MAGIC, which is the Martial Arts Gang Intervention Club. And this, this is a program that's set up for those who can't afford that type of training, but we don't want them not to be able to be involved in that. So we kind of take the, uh, the brunt of the paying, the cost, and the uniforms and things like that. So now you just mentioned, of course, that there's a, a, a strong charitable component. How do you fund those those things for the people that cannot afford uh, the tuition for your for your group? Well, we what, what I'd like to do, and generally what I do is I, I mix the two together. Um, those who are part of the the regular traditional class, and then the, those who are the, what we call the magic kids, mm -hmm. are are mixed together. So there's no difference. You can't tell one from the other. Uh, we take the we 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 um, um, take the costs from our regular students and we just put it all together and we, we absorb the cost of the payment for okay. that. Now do you get involved in some charitable or other kinds of, of things like that as, as the organization? Yes we do. We have, we have uh, uh, once a year we have what's called Kicking for Heroes and the Kicking for Heroes program is um, we, pick, we pick a charity that we're, all, we're passionate about. And it might, you know, it could, it could vary different ones. Our first Kicking for Heroes program I believe was in 2014 and we did it for St. Jude's. From okay. St. Jude's, and I think uh, then after that we did um, the uh, uh, Wounded Warrior Project, mm -hmm. and then last year's program was for the um, the families of those officers that were killed in Dallas Police Department. Okay, so it's it's something that's just above and beyond what you're doing day to day. It's it's serving others beyond the, the immediate family within your organization. Absolutely, and I think that's what most martial arts schools should be. It's not just, um, a lot of people have a tendency to believe that a martial arts is, that we're just um, either a sport or focused solely on you know training self defense or training in you know the uh, the warrior arts but the, that's that's the that's the point when it comes to the warrior arts there is a lot more that encompasses that when you start thinking of i'm not interested in in training better fighters we are interested in training human beings we're not running a business to make money we're running a business to invest in people and so with that component, we, when, when it comes to teaching, especially our younger children, we teach them the importance of being able to give. 
You know, the old, um, you know, and I hate to use this cliche because it's used a lot, but the old, the old adage that um, the word samurai means to serve, we teach it to our children that to be a better human being is to first be able to serve. It's great to be able to protect yourself, and we want that, but that's the physical part of it. Mm -hmm. We want them to be able to develop the, the mental and, the, and, the, and them to be a stronger character. Mm -hmm. And that strong character helps in, like I said, being able to serve others, being able to do more from your, for your community. What can you do as a person to become better human beings, and how can you pass that on? So how long does it take somebody to become sort of competent? I'm, I'm sure that if you go longer, you're going to become more competent. But how long does it take before you're not falling over your own feet and, and do something that is more coordinated in, in this well, activity? I, I've been doing it for, um, I've been training in the martial arts and, and teaching for um, almost 40 years. Um, I still fall over my own feet. Oh, OK. okay. <laughs> um, okay but uh, you know, I have a lot of people come up to me, and they'll, they'll come in and say, well, how long will, will it take me to make black belt? How long? And, and, and I, can no, I can no longer tell you more. Right. I can no more tell you that than I can see what, what you can do. It's all about you, the individual. I will tell, and I tell everybody right up, uh, up front when they start in, um, I don't give rank easy. You know, some, some people come to me and say, I've been at this place, and I've been there two years, and I've got a black belt, I'd like to. And then I'll, I'll check them and say, you know, that's not what we do here. I'm not interested in the color of your belt. I'm interested in your ability to be able to train. It does take a long process, but as far as being able to defend yourself, I believe that a person should be able to defend themselves immediately. So in the beginning ranks, white, yellow, white belt, yellow belt, they're already learning stuff immediately the first day that they can apply. So there's an immediate immediate payoff to, to, to understanding absolutely. this and, and becoming more aware of how to use your body in these situations. Absolutely, absolutely. Everything should be done. There should be no waiting time. Everything should be done immediately. Um, a per like I said, a person comes in, they start off. The first day, they're already learning things that they never knew before. They're having to retrain their bodies and things. Even learning how to fall down and stand up is something that we start with. You know, this is how, you lo this is how long you've been doing this. This is the new way of doing this. Great. How can somebody contact you? If somebody's interested in learning more about the Defense Training Institute and learning how to defend themselves, how can they contact you? You can get, you can get a hold of me through my website. There's a contact information on there. It's um, www.defensetraininginstitute.net. Um, just the one word. I'm also, um, um, you'll see that you know, I'm on the front of my windows there, my, that's my, actually my cell number, 630-234-1631. And I, you know, I generally, if, if, if for some reason I don't answer the phone call, it's probably because I'm teaching classes or teaching private lessons, and I return the calls within 24 hours. And where are you located? I'm located at 104 First Street, right in downtown Batavia. Excellent. Well, Eddie, thank you so much for joining us and for telling us all about how we can defend ourselves. You're thank welcome. You. You're welcome. Oops, I got the pen to flip. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Tom Wangler, president of Confident Air. Regular maintenance can prolong the life of your furnace and keep your energy costs to a minimum. Plus, there's less of a chance of a breakdown on a cold winter night. Your furnace needs proper care and attention to keep it running smoothly, so you don't end up paying too much for heating during the cold winter months, or worse yet, with deadly carbon monoxide poisoning. We recommend an annual inspection to ensure safe operation. Confident Air, your trusted home comfort professionals since 1992. The King County Chronicle is your best source for news and information in print and online in the Tri-Cities and Caneland. This is Chronicle Country. 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 Back to Batavia Spotlight. I'm Ellen Huxtable and I'm here today with Chris Cudworth, the Communication Coordinator for the City of Batavia. Hi Ellen. Hello Chris. Thank you for joining us. Yes, it's fun. Tell us, what does the Communications Coordinator do? Well, I'm going to share two quick stories sort okay. of introduce the concept because I first moved into Batavia way back in 85 and uh, probably the first week there uh, a couple local kids got rambunctious and threw a rock through our front window. And within a half an hour, uh, one of the um, detectives from town had mm -hmm. come by and already identified, you know, the problem. And, and we came to a resolution. He asked if we wanted to press charges. I said, no, they're just kids. And it, it just impressed me that someone knew their town so well. Mm -hmm. And flash forward, because I lived in Batavia for 20 years, and... Um, 
I was out walking my dog one day and there were uh, some workers out there, city workers, and they were, they had this large shovel and I was watching them work and the, the craft to which they were using the shovel, uh, you know, trenching out this uh, fine area so it wouldn't disturb the, the land of the people uh, that owned that property. And I thought, I walked up to them and I said, you know, do people know what you guys do? And, you know, I wasn't with the city then, and, and they said, no, probably not. And that sort of has stuck in my head, that there, uh, you know, is this whole uh, operations that the city uh, goes by that we all, as citizens, sort of take for granted. Mm -hmm. um, so whether it's the public works or, you know, our water treatment or uh, our police or our fire departments, um, there are really dedicated, really knowledgeable people and uh, they're doing a really great job, and it's almost always behind the scenes. Right. So the communications coordinator position was created, you know, at the city of Batavia in order to do several things. Um, but I, I'm going to place something at the front, too, because one of the primary reasons for the role is to increase access to information from, uh, to citizens of uh, Batavia. And so that includes our website, that includes our social media, the things that uh, people depend upon, you know, to sort of know what's going on in town. And, you know, there's uh, laws about also, you know, public information called FOIA, which is a request for public information, Freedom of Information Act. But a lot of the interactions between us and the citizenry is more about, well, what's going to be on the city agenda? Exactly. And, uh, you know, what kinds of things, uh, when is that going to be on? What time can I hear about it? You know, that sort of thing. So uh, one of our top priorities is to make sure that that type of public access information is available. I know our councilmen, you know, do a lot of homework before they ever get to those meetings. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes it's hard because they've done all the study and people show up from the community and they want to know answers to things right. that they maybe could have gotten before they got there. Mm -hmm. um, so it can feel like the city sort of rolling ahead without you know having dealt with some of these things when in fact a lot of the information is already out there so we want people to be as informed as possible so they can participate in the decision making of the city of Batavia. So in other words what you're saying is that the information was there it was carefully gathered mm -hmm. it was available but people didn't know how to access that information so that they could stay abreast of the things that were being discussed and the, the, the the, the degree to which they're being discussed and, and considered. Yes, you know, decisions aren't uh, easy to make, you know, in many cases on uh, civic or uh, city business. And, you know, the people who run and, and serve as elected officials do put in a lot of time. You know, mm -hmm. there's uh, at least a couple standard meetings per week, and then there's committee meetings, and there's uh, interactions with the city staff and the city administrator, uh, Laura Newman. Um, you know, there's all this interaction that's going on, and really it's between sort of the city and the representatives of the, of the community uh, right. that are having these engagements. And one of the things we really, really want people to know is that we value um, feedback and interaction. And so one of the things I'm trying to do um, is to make sure people know what ward they live in. That's so that true. If they want to know who to contact, um, you know, that sort of thing. I, I have to admit, I lived 20 years in the city of Batavia. I just moved with my new wife to North Aurora, but we're, uh, we're on Park District property uh -huh. uh, on the back side of it. But um, the thing that I think a lot of people don't even know who their elected representative is, and we need to increase that awareness because I, I've been to you know a number of council and committee the whole meetings and uh, you watch how this transpires and we broadcast them too uh, on BATV uh, there's a lot of information covered in a fairly short amount of time even though right. some of those meetings run long Absolutely. and when the issues become contentious you know about a project or about something ongoing um, you know, there's a room there for community comment, but right. there has to be sort of a limit, and that can frustrate people. So we want people to know there are ways that they can communicate uh, with their council members and with the mayor and with the city administrator that are legitimate and justified and, and easy to use. So your responsibilities include developing and maintaining those lines of communication between the, the citizens and the elected officials in, in the city in general. Yes, and and to go beyond that a little bit too, uh -huh. because I come from a journalistic background, and uh, I sort of view myself as the brand journalist for the city of Batavia. Okay. So I've been out there uh, looking for stories and interviewing people that are uh, not just community leaders, but sometimes 
um, people that are, you know, just engaged somewhat interesting way in the city. Mm -hmm. And so I really invite people to get a hold of me um, with really interesting people or stories, uh, the real heart of what's going on in Batavia because there's so many good stories. And I even want to get out there and interview, and I've already told our public works staff I want to do a ride along with the guy who does the street sweeping and see what that's really like, you know? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Or, or the snow removal. God bless our snow removal people. Well, uh, our city administrator, Laura Newman, wanted to go on a ride around this winter. However, uh, it didn't uh, snow. we didn't get any snow for, a, I think it was 150 days. Yeah. That's the first time that we've had that in a long, long time. Um, so she has a rain check on that one. So, um, but I, I've already done some stories on people like Andrea Pedraza, who's a city engineer, and the, the work we're actually having, um, you know, a ceremony to celebrate a, a bridge project she worked on for eight years. People don't know that these things take a long time. Your intergovernmental agreements between the county and the state and IDOT and the city, those all take time to work out. And uh, then the engineering can take place, you know, and only until then. So uh, I've been really impressed. There's so many smart people. And, and you go around Batavia, too, and, and just even walk down the streets of, you know, Wilson Street mm -hmm. and just get engaged in conversation with people. It's amazing what you find out about Absolutely. this town. So how can people get a hold of you? If they want to find out more, if they have a question, if they don't know who their alderman is, how can they get a hold of you? Well, we are all on the city website. Okay. And all our email addresses and our phones are on there. I invite people. Uh, I also ask people to take a look at the upper right corner of the nav bar, the navigation bar on our website. Um, there on the far right side there's a, a little column called Batavia Plus and that's where we're publishing some of these okay. things. We're breaking them down into regional and then city profiles and voices. And one of the things we want to do is show some of the impacts like Fermilab, uh, major growth going on out there, and even our mosquito abatement firm that treats the city. Um, we, those are the regional issues. The city profile is going to be about our actual staff and some of the volunteers who work in the city. And then voices is things that we want to hear from, uh, you know, um, people in the community, what they think and that sort of thing. And they can uh, submit an opportunity to write about something and that sort of thing. It's not really an open forum because it's not really appropriate. Um, we do have a great uh, Facebook page, um, City of Batavia. Um, that's a good thing. If we have a Twitter feed, so there's lots of different ways they can reach out to Excellent. us. And, this, and in closing, the City of Batavia's website is uh, cityofbatavia.net. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us and for telling us about what we should know about about our city. So thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. The Drendel and Jansen's Law Group has practiced law in Aurora since 1961 and in Batavia since 1994. We focus our energy on representing people and businesses and families in the local community. We represent clients in Kane and surrounding counties in matters ranging from divorce to wills, business law to zoning. We focus our efforts on planning and working towards positive resolutions for businesses and families. When clients need someone to fight for their interests, we're ready, willing, and able to act as aggressive advocates to protect their interests. Trendle and Jansen's Law Group with offices in Batavia and Aurora and located on the web at bataviaLaw.com. Downtown Batavia, always moving by nature. Recreation. Nature. The arts. Specialty shops. Restaurants and services. Downtown is everyone's neighborhood. Come, celebrate, meet friends, unwind. See you downtown. Welcome back to Batavia Spotlight. I'm Ellen Huxtable. I'm here today with Lori Hewitt, the Executive Director of the Elder Day Center. So tell us, Lori, tell us about the Elder Day Center. Well, Elder Day Center is an adult daycare center. We're located in the Bethany Lutheran Church Community Center, which I believe was an old elementary school mm -hmm. right on the corner of Wilson and Lincoln. Uh, what we provide is daycare center for seniors, 55 and older. Some of our clients have early memory loss, some dementia, some Alzheimer's, but we do have some clients that just come that are looking for care for the day. Uh, what we provide is a snack at 10 o'clock, a snack at 2, and a hot meal at lunchtime. Wow. And um, it's a nice respite. It's, uh, it's a nice place for people to bring their loved one, to know that they're cared for during the day. Mm -hmm. They're going to be 
loved. We have a full-time RN. We have a social worker. So if they need medications, that's you know legally dispensed with our RN. Um, and it's a nice place that people can get a break. Caring for a senior sometimes can be daunting. It's 24-7. And uh, so it's a nice way for people to just get a little bit of a break, know that their caregiver, you know, they can go get their hair done, get their nails done, get their groceries done, yeah. run their errands, that type of thing. And uh, so the only requirement we ask is that they come two days a week. Okay. We find that if it's one day, it just is too hard for a, a client to acclimate. Yeah. And at least five hours each day. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, how many clients do you have in, in your program? We currently have 27. We can house 35 by space and by state law. Um, but we have 27, they don't all come every day. So mm -hmm. I think the highest census we probably have actually is a Friday and we have 19 people that come on Fridays. And is this paid for by the families or the clients or is there some subsidies for this? We have a little bit of both. Uh, most of our clients are private pay. We only charge thirteen fifty an hour, which is pretty reasonable mm -hmm. considering what you receive. Um, and we have a couple clients that are what are called CCP through community care program through the state. Um, right now, the state's not really funding a lot of programs, yeah. and uh, so we're waiting for funding for those people, but that's not going to ever keep us from not accepting someone. And so what kind of programming is offered during the day? What kind of things do people do? Well, I do a little bit of everything. Um, we try to change up our programming every 45 minutes so that nobody ever gets bored, and then we try to do things for some of our higher functioning and lower functioning clients. We play bingo, we play bunko. Um, being in an elementary school is great because we have a gym. Uh -huh. So we walk laps, we do a lot of exercises, which is wonderful. Uh, we play with a beach ball, we can set up chairs and play with the beach ball and get that type of ex exercise. We try to do mental stimulation, so we do puzzles. Um, we try to do things that will help someone with dementia recall things. So we'll mm -hmm. go back in time and say, what happened this day in 1940 or 1950? Mm -hmm. That always helps our clients and they bring back a lot of fun memories. Um, and so we just try to kind of work, work around things. We try to go off site once a month and do um, a field trip, mm -hmm. an outing. Our clients really enjoy that. We just went to Fermilab okay. and saw the buffalo. Oh, good. And uh, our nurse, her husband actually works at Fermilab, so mm -hmm. he got on the bus and gave us the whole history of Fermi and what they do and why the buffalo are there and the whole background. So we try to take them off site once in a while to do something different. Now, are there some uh, clients or potential clients who are are not able to work within your program that are that are maybe a very severe dementia or very severe physical limitations. We do have some people that come to our our center and then eventually go to an Arden Courts or Brighton Gardens or Autumn Leaves. So we work really closely with those people, and vice versa. Some of those clients, some clients may go to those places mm -hmm. and not realize that they're not ready for that. So they can just come to us during the day. So we work really closely with a lot of the organizations in the area. So as far as time of the day, you said there's a minimum number of hours you'd like to have people there, but it's flexible within that. Right. So that people can use more or less time as, as things go on. Exactly. We're there from 8 to 5.30 every day, Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. And that really helps people. So some people come a minimum of five hours. Some people come from 8 to 5.30. And uh, two days a week, three days a week, we do have some clients that come every day. What kinds of things do your clients like about, about your facility, about your programs? I think one of the things that I think most of our clients find the best is that it's like home. I mean, we have a staff of nine. It's very close-knit. It's very fun. Uh, they build friendships. They socialize. Uh, it keeps them kind of able to stay in their home longer, stay with loved ones. About 80% of our clients actually live with a husband or a wife or a, care, or a daughter okay. or a son. Only three of our clients actually live in like a Bickford or an assisted living. So I think that they enjoy being in that environment where it's kind of like home. We have a, a kitchen. We have a lady that runs our kitchen that cooks for us. So it's, it's a small enough environment where it's friendly and comfortable and they know the staff. Other than their, their care is within the limits of what you can offer and the age limit, are there other uh, criteria in order for somebody to become involved in your program? The only basic criteria we have is that they have to be mobile with okay. either a walker or a cane and that they're able to be independent in the bathroom. Do they have to be within a certain geographic area as far as living? No, actually we have some people come, you know, as far as Sycam from Sycamore. We have some people from North Aurora and Aurora, so we really don't have a geographic 
um, entity that we stick to. So you're probably one of the great hidden treasures for families that need exactly. this. Exactly. that I just started as executive director in February, and I am finding that a lot of people don't know that we're there, right. and they don't know the services we offer. And I know that I'm caring for my husband's uh, mother, my father-in-law just passed, and I'm starting to really realize that that's a great service for anybody that cares for a loved one, whether it be a mom or a dad or a husband or a wife. It's just a really nice way to get that break and know that your caregiver, your loved one is being cared for. So somebody can come just once in a while or they can come for the longer time. Right. So how do people get a hold of you? If people are interested in learning more, how can they find you? Well, they can find us on our website, okay. elderdaycenter.org, and then they can contact us. Direct phone number is 630-761-9750. Or they can feel free to give me a call um, directly. We'd love to have anybody come take a tour to see what a nice, homey, kind of fun environment we have for seniors. And your address is? We are at 328 West Wilson Street. We are on the corner of Wilson and Lincoln, right behind the Bethany Lutheran Church. Excellent. Well, thank you so much thank for joining so us much. and telling us about, about the organization. And I appreciate the invitation. Good, Good to see you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Batavia Spotlight. I'm your host, Ellen Huxtable. Catch up on previous episodes on our website, mybatv.com, and follow us on Facebook at BATV1017. Thanks for watching.